Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Think about your favorite movie, the one with this great plot twist at the end that no one saw coming and took everybody by surprise. What movie would you include in that list? Sixth Sense? I see dead people. How about Star Wars? You're whose father? How about Arrival? How does that, how does that circle go or psycho here? Don't look behind the curtain, whatever you do. Or even the very first Planet of the Apes. Really? The Statue of Liberty? I didn't see that one coming. We love a good movie where um, it keeps us glued and guessing all the way to the end. And the writers throw these red herrings that you go after and see if that's the answer. Sometimes the camera focuses for a beat or two on something that seems insignificant, and you stop and say, wait, what? What am I looking at here, and why is this important? Oh, we love a good plot twist, don't we? And we think Hollywood is so clever. But really, Hollywood has stolen that whole genre right from us, right from Scripture. There's a plot twist here today that no one saw coming, took everybody by surprise. And we're still telling the story today. The opening scene. Early morning, the sun is just peeking over the horizon. There's a young woman, 30-ish. She's coming down a single path, well-worn. She's not in a hurry. She's kind of plodding. And as she's plodding, she's reminiscing of the brutal murder of her friend a couple of days earlier on a cross by the Romans. The camera closes in on her dusty feet with, with simple leather straps holding on her sandals. She's going to a cemetery. She's in no hurry. The dead don't go anywhere. She's going to pay respects to a friend who has died. When she gets there, the camera goes onto her face, and there is surprise. No, there, there's horror as she looks and the camera pans over to the entrance of the tomb. The rock, very large, has been rolled away, and now you've got this opening. It's dark inside. She's, she's afraid to go in, and at first she's thinking, grave robbers, grave robbers. Then she thought, maybe it's the zombie apocalypse. She thinks twice, no, grave robbers. It's grave robbers. And she puts down her spices that she's going to use to anoint the body, and she races off. And now the scene ends. You see her backside, the hair flowing, and the backs of her sandals as she's running. Moments later, two disciples come down that very same narrow path, Peter and John. And they're jostling each other. They're, they're panting. They're running there's always been this silly competition between these two about who Jesus loves the most, who is his best friend, who he confides in. They're, they're racing down this until, until John throws an elbow and gets ahead of the older Peter, races, gets to the tomb first, looks inside, but then he catches his breath just long enough for Peter to come down the same path, barrel past him and just goes on into the tomb. That's like Peter. That's like Peter, impetuous. The camera looks at him. Is it bewildered? His brow is furrowed. He looks inside. And as the camera's on him, you see John coming behind him, trying to look around Peter to see what he's looking at. The word here in, in the Greek that Peter has is theoreo. 
theoreo, which doesn't mean just to see. It's not as if he's just using his eyes and he's looking inside. Theoreo. What English word do you hear from that? Theoreo. Theory, right? He's theorizing. He's analyzing. He's trying to figure out what he's looking at because it takes him by surprise. This is CSI Jerusalem. There's a, there's a murder mystery here, and we don't know who's done it yet. Theoreo. And what's he looking at? At one side are the grave cloths. And they're, as you kind of expect, crumpled up. But then the camera moves. It almost misses it. But at the head, at the head of the bed, is a small cloth that's folded. The text says this. I've got the text. It says this. The cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. That cloth that was over his face, folded neatly in place and put off to the side. And so, and so Peter is theoreo. He is theorizing. It's not grave robbers. Grave robbers do the snatch and grab. They, they come in quickly as possible, grab what they want, and they're gone. Nobody's saying, whoa, whoa, stop. Come on, we've made a mess here. Let's clean up. No, that's not grave robbers. And zombies, they're not too fastidious about what they wear. They're, it's not that either. They don't know what. It is a crime scene, and we don't know what's going on. Peter and John look at each other, whisper, and then they just leave down that same path in single file. While Mary is a hot mess here on the floor, crying next to the empty tomb, weeping. And the camera goes, pans out, and suddenly you see the entrance of the tomb that once had been dark, <coughs> now there is this heavenly glow inside. It gets her attention. Tentatively, she goes over and she looks inside. Startling? Yes. Frightening? Surprisingly, no. Who are they? Are they people? No. Not like any person she's ever seen. Are they angels? I suppose I've never seen one before. But it could be. Before she speaks, she wants them to go first, and <clears throat> they do speak up. Why are you crying? Why am I crying? Why does anybody cry at a cemetery? Why does anybody cry at a funeral? Why does anybody cry? when a loved one is killed? Seems like a silly question to, from an angel, but she doesn't confront the angel. She simply says, they have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they put him. The question is asked a second time, only this time not by the angels. You can tell there's a voice coming from behind Mary, outside the tomb. She turns. Now, you and I, because of the camera angle, you and I know it's Jesus. Mary, she has no idea. Woman, why are you crying? Why doesn't Mary recognize the voice of Jesus? Maybe it's now the sun's coming up and the sun's right behind Jesus and it's kind of blinding and she really can't see his face. Maybe that's it. Or maybe he is so out of context that it doesn't make sense. 
You know when you see somebody in one context and then another? Like, <clears throat> like when you see your pastor at a restaurant on a Friday night? Is that Pastor Scott? I'm not sure. Is it? Does he have a life outside a church? Where is he? I hope I behave myself. Maybe that's it. Last time she saw him, he was a bloody mess coming down from a cross. It's jarring. It's out of context. Or maybe he is in his resurrected self. That is, he's no longer the beat up one. He's no longer just resuscitated. There's a third life form here of resurrection. Maybe that's it. Or maybe she is so distraught, her face is in her hands, and she's weeping, and her eyes are filled with tears, she can't, she can't see. But eventually she does. And the whole plot twist, the whole CSI Jerusalem changes with a single word. You know, it's like when you've watched a movie, and finally in the last scene, you know, they give you the final piece and it fits in and you're wondering, how did I miss this all this time? How did I miss it? Now she thinks, of course, it's the gardener, which is the more simple answer, right? If it's not grave robbers, if it's not zombies, well then it's got to be the gardener. He's cleaning up the area, it's the most simple solution. But you know, at least in the movies, the most simple solution, the one the writers kind of push you towards, is never the answer, right? Tell me where you put it, Mary, put him, Mary said, and I'll go get him. Everything changes with a single word. Did you catch it? Mary. That's the final piece in this obscure, complex puzzle. Mary. With Mary, all those clues kind of come together, and finally it makes sense. Mary. Suddenly there's resolution, and the plot twists to final completion. Mary. Her eyes are open. She sees who he is and she believes. She wants to stay, but Jesus says, you go. Go and tell the others that I'm alive. In the final scene, she's running down that path, hair flying. You see the backs of her sandals. <clears throat> she finds the disciples and says, he is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And they have a party and there's a celebration. And no one saw it coming. Everybody was taken by surprise. <clears throat> that he is risen. And this whole Easter celebration then comes as such a surprise that everybody celebrates because no one saw it coming. Thanks be to God. Amen. Wait a second, could you put my mic back on? It probably goes without saying. But do you know what the surprise ending was? I mean, I don't want this to be like that movie Inception in which the top is spinning and you're not sure, is it a dream or a reality? I want to be clear that you know what the surprise ending is. I bet you're thinking it's the resurrection of Jesus, right? I mean, after all, it is Easter, and we've said he is risen, risen indeed several times back and forth, and the emphasis is on Jesus. I get that. You're probably thinking the surprise ending that took everybody by surprise is the resurrection of Jesus, right? I mean, Paul says that from the text that Barbara read up here. He makes the argument, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, everything collapses. Christmas is only a birth announcement. 
without Easter. A baptism is just a human rite with water and word without the resurrection. Communion is just a meal to remember a supper that Jesus had without the resurrection. Paul says our whole faith and our church and everything we stand for crumbles if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I bet you're thinking the resurrection of Jesus is the surprise ending that took everybody by surprise. And you'd be wrong. That's not it. Do you know what it is? Go back to that last scene in which Jesus has a single word, Mary. That's the surprise ending. Because the Lord God of the universe, who created the heavens and the earth, who scooped out the oceans and raised up the mountains, put the Leviathan into the deeps and the eagles soaring by the clouds, this very same God knows you and calls you by name. When you're in that dark and despair, he calls you by name into his brilliant light. When there is shame and forgiveness, he calls you by name into forgiveness. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he calls you by name into a new life. The surprise twist of Easter is not Jesus' resurrection. It's your resurrection. His resurrection means your resurrection. His new life means your new life. That's the surprise ending. Jesus said many times, listen, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, be arrested, die, and in three days I'm going to rise again. That's not the plot twist. It's the fact when he calls you by name, when he removes the stone from your tomb, when he cracks the seal of your coffin, when he opens up your urn, and he takes you by the hand, lifts you up, and he calls you by name. This is not about the righteous one living again. This is about the unrighteous ones, the broken ones, you and I living again. When he calls us by name, and the angels say, Mary is risen, John is risen, Susan is risen, Scott is risen. And the other angels say, risen indeed. That's the twist. That this Easter story is not so much about Jesus. It's about you and me living again when he calls us by name. No one saw it coming. I bet not even you. Thanks be to God. Amen.